another Sunday morning worship. First and foremost, happy Mother's Day to all the moms are in the congregation. We can't see you on Zoom, but that's where we're pointing to. Um, we're going to get started today, um, and so if you can uh, please join us, uh, please stand if you are able. Um, if you're at home, stand anyways, because it's awesome. to the sun. Your kingdom come, that your way. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for another sunny morning in which we can gather our hearts and minds together in worship of your majesty. We also thank you that we have been able to expand church meeting in person and pray that the day would come soon when we can all gather in person again. Please watch over the health of those in Berkeley and in your church. We also ask that you bless today's sermon and that it would reflect the full truth of your written word. Please speak into our hearts this morning to understand your will in new ways and to equip us and compel us to display your love and grace to the world while we wait for your return. Thank you for your son's death and resurrection from the cross to show us that sin has been conquered through you. Thank you for taking on our sin and shame for us and clothing us, covering us in your righteousness so that we may not live in fear, but in confidence as we live with new identities grounded in what you have accomplished, not what we have done. And so in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, Vinewood. And also, happy Mother's Day. Um, my name's Ho Yun, and I'm currently working as a counselor for Awana on Friday nights. I'm really happy to see all you here today. And for those joining us on Zoom, I welcome you as well. And so we have a couple of announcements. The first one is we welcome all newcomers. So um, we'd love to be connected with you. If you're interested in being connected, please, um, I'm pretty sure on the Zoom chat right now, there's also going to be a link with a um, welcome card. So you could fill that out and we could um, contact you. Alternatively, if there isn't a link that you see, there, it's also available on our webpage. So you can find that at vinewoodcfc.com. And also, if you have a chance to stay afterwards on our Zoom call, you can also hang out in the breakout rooms afterwards because there's probably going to be people there um, lingering too. Okay, and if you haven't noticed already, Sunday service reservations have been opened. So this means that starting every Wednesday on our vinewoodcfc.com website, there's a form that you can fill out if you're interested in participating in in-person church. And then depending on who signs up, we're able to um, fill people in this room right here up to a 35% capacity. So if you're interested, just remember to fill that out every week. And once again, another reminder is that our Sunday service has been moved to 9.30 instead of 9.40. Also, we have a new announcement that VBS volunteers are needed. So VBS, for those who aren't uh, familiar, it stands for Vacation Bible School. And so this is something that we host during the summer for the children in kindergarten through fifth grade from July 19th to the 23rd from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So this is a relatively short-term kind of volunteer work that we can do. Um, but yeah, we're looking for volunteers who can help us teach Bible lessons, act in skits, sing and dance for worship, lead crafts and games, and help with sound and tech. We have virtual and in-person roles, and you can help on the weekend too if you aren't available during the actual program. So come and make disciples with us. Sign up is possible using the QR code on that graphic right now. And you can also contact Monica Lee for more information. Next, we have spring baptism. We have one brother and one sister getting baptized next week. So our baptism service is going to take place next Sunday, May 16th at 1.30 p.m. And we're going to have a live stream available on our homepage as well. And regarding baptism, there's also an announcement that um, today is the last baptism class we have, like um, before we actually do the baptizing. And it's usually at 11, but I believe it was pushed to 11.30 for today. And next off, since it's the second Sunday of the month, just a reminder that we're having communion later during today's service. So if you're joining us from home or over Zoom, you still have some time to grab elements before the end of the sermon today. And this is something that um, we partake in as a church community together. So if you are a, a baptized believer and um, you're interested in joining, please do. We also have prayer meeting. So we're hosting an online Zoom call prayer meeting for all of you to join at 1230. The link can be found on the homepage of our website. This is a time for congregation members to pray for the world, the church, and for each other. So we hope to see you there. And lastly, if you have offering this morning, we encourage you to give online via Zelle Pay or PayPal. Information can be found online in the Give tab on our website. And now I'll pass it over to Pastor Dennis. All right, good morning, everyone. 
Uh, happy Mother's Day as well. I'd be remiss to not uh, give my <laughs> kind of my happy Mother's Day greeting. Uh, if you have your Bible, please turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter 12 this morning. We are in Matthew uh, chapter 12. What do you think of when I say the word family? And especially maybe even today uh, during Mother's Day, you might be thinking of your mom. Maybe you think of your parents just in general, your mom, your dad, your siblings if you have any. Maybe you have like a very big, large, extended family. So you think of your aunts and your uncles, your cousins, your, uh, you know, your nephews or nieces, whoever it may be. Maybe you think of things like Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas morning, the, these times where you gather together as a family. Maybe for some of us, when we think of our biological family, we don't, we don't, it doesn't bring a lot of great memories. So perhaps you think of friends that you grew up with, uh, close friends that you made in college. Maybe you think of your own husband or wife or kids. Regardless, when we think of family, we normally think of the people closest to us, right? The people that actually garner our highest loyalty and priority. There's a special place, an intimate connection uh, that we innately relate with when we think of family. That word family will bring something very deep within us. And perhaps maybe, maybe that's why when we watch certain movies, there's just some movies that will just hit you in a different way because it brings about this uniqueness and uh, of family. It brings about just how cherished family is, right? All I need to say is something like, I love you 3,000. And half of you are already like hold back tears again because it brings back such vivid memories. The other half of you are like 3,000 what? Years? Dollars? Square feet? What are we talking about here? Right? Like, uh, and so as we continue in our Matthew series, The One True King, we're going to be talking about family this morning. Matthew, in fact, talks a lot about family. He talks about, he uses the word brothers more than almost any other New Testament book except for one. That also goes with the word father. Only one other book uses it more than Matthew. He uses the word mother more times than any other New Testament book. Family matters in Matthew and to Matthew. And when he speaks of Jesus' upside-down kingdom, he wants, as, and as Jesus is turning our kingdoms upside down, it includes family as well. And what family looks like in Jesus' upside-down kingdom. Living right side up in this upside-down kingdom not only brings us into a new kingdom or new way of living, but also into a new family as well. So for us this morning, we can summarize the passage and sermon in this way. Following Christ by faith is not only an expression of the will of God, but it brings us into a family and binds us to the people of God. I'll repeat that again. Following Christ by faith is not only an expression of the will of God, but it brings us into a family and binds us to the people of God. So if you would follow along with me as I read Matthew chapter 12 this morning, we're going to be in verse 46 through 50. So not many verses this morning. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. Um, I'm missing a verse here. I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, sorry. Someone told him, your mother and your brother are standing outside asking to speak to you. But he replied to the man who, who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciple, he says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. All right, so if you would recall from last week, we were challenged by Jesus' teaching about himself. Jesus says he is the greater priest. Jesus is the greater prophet. Jesus is the greater king. And the implications of that we saw, right, it meant that his words should be listened to, should be accepted, it should be obeyed. We should be surrendering to Jesus as our king. It meant tr turning and trusting 
Jesus by faith. And the Pharisees, the main antagonists of kind of our narrative here, they did none of that. They attributed Jesus' divine work to the devil. They refused to submit to Jesus' teachings and commands, but instead they saw Jesus as a threat to their own influence and power. We were reminded last week that a half-hearted obedience or acceptance was pretty much the same thing as rejection. And it was an insufficient response. And we saw that parable of the unclean spirit returning to, his, uh, to its host with seven more spirits, leaving the person worse off than when they started. So merely trying to be a good person, trying to be a moral person or an upstanding person was not enough. That was an insufficient response. Now, there's nothing wrong with being moral or being good, but that was just not enough in responding to Christ. There was more to just that. And so what we're told that while Jesus is still speaking to the people, presuming, uh, presumably teaching this parable, giving these implications that if rejected and ignored, uh, you know, these are the consequences. We find out Jesus' family at that time is trying to get his attention. Right? In verse 46, it tells us that his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to Jesus. Now, we might notice that his father was not around, and most likely we, uh, uh, Joseph, his, his father, his earthly father, probably passed away by then. So it's here, Mary, his mother, and his half-brothers are there asking to speak to him. We learn a little bit more about Jesus' family in the Gospel of Mark and John. Uh, but we're told that at that time, Jesus' family wasn't exactly on board with what Jesus was doing. Right, with the things that Jesus was teaching and claiming, they were not feeling it. John chapter 7 verse 5 uh, tells us that for not even his brothers believed in him. They might have thought that Jesus has maybe gone mad for, uh, with what he was saying. Mark chapter 3 verse 21 tells us that when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. His family, his own family, thought that he was crazy. And what we have learned here is Mary, his mother, and his half-brothers are standing outside as Jesus was teaching. And they were requesting from the outside to speak to Jesus. A theologian, R.T. France, notes that this suggests a lack of wholehearted response. They were not intently listening to Jesus from the inside, but they were actually on the peripheral. And they were probably trying to come to get Jesus in hopes to maybe quiet him down for his own sake. All right, for after all, they might have seen or even heard of kind of the things that the Pharisees are saying and doing. And they've seen kind of this interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the people that, that are teaching. And the people who say, like, we are the ones that would understand this religion best. We would understand who the Messiah is. And there's this already this tense confrontation has been going on be between them. So... They might not have the wrong motives per se because they love Jesus. They care for Jesus. They want the best for him. And, they, and with that best intention, they're going to get their crazy brother or crazy son, right, who proclaims to be the son of God, shaking the hornet's nest again. And they're, they're going to try to save him. And who better else to tell, uh, than to tell Jesus than his own family, right? And if they came after him, I mean, their family after all. Jesus would listen to them, right? He should respond to family, especially if they had to choose between family, people that he grew up with, or people that he loved and that loved him, versus this crowd of people. They would, he would bound to take a break and be like, oh, hold on, right? My family's calling. I'm going to go talk to them. Now, verse 47 might be omitted in some of your Bibles because some of the older manuscripts actually didn't include it. But you might have found a footnote in the bottom of your Bible that would tell you that in some manuscripts it said this, right? Someone told him your mother and your brother, brothers are standing outside asking to speak to you. Pretty much repeating verse 46. And we see how does Jesus respond? Right, you got family coming, knocking at your door, wanting to speak with you. What will you do? Uh, Leon Morris, he shed some light in the cultural understanding of that time. I mean, I think even for us, we would probably have some sort of understanding of what, what, how we should respond to family. But even in their cultural times, it's a little bit different. He says this, the impression Matthew gives is the family felt 
that is coming to Jesus, right, his mother and brothers, felt they had prior rights. They could interrupt him in the middle of a teaching session, and he should stop what he was doing to come to them. This might arise out of the very strong family loyalty that was universally accepted. A dutiful son and brother would not leave his family in order to teach the crowds. But instead, Jesus does something that was totally unexpected of that time, totally unexpected from his own physical family. He replies with the question, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And he stretches out his arms. He points to his disciples and says, here are my mother and my brothers. And then he qualifies again in verse 50. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brothers and my sisters and mother. What he's doing, he's not literally saying like, oh, these are my, this is my mother and these are my brothers giving them new roles. But instead he's saying, these, this, is, this is my family. He sets up a spiritual family that calls for a deeper, a deeper loyalty and a higher priority. He's saying, you want to know who family really is? He points to those who follow him. He sets it up to teach those around him and for us this morning that faith in Christ, right, following our king, brings about a new type of family. A family that doesn't come with physical ties, but it comes with spiritual ones. Uh, Douglas Sean O'Donnell says that Jesus, he's not dissolving natural family bonds, but he's showing the strength of this supernatural family bond. He's not trying to say your family right now doesn't matter. He's trying to show that now that you're in a spiritual family, what does that look like? What is the priority? How much does that matter to you? Following Christ by faith is not only an expression of the will of God, but it brings us into a family and binds us to a people of God. So for the rest of our time this morning, we are going to focus on what this spiritual family is about. What does this passage show us, and how do we respond to it? First, we're going to see that this family is entered by faith and faith alone. This family is entered by faith. If you're anything like me, you might have been thinking to yourself, wait a minute. Right? After reading these uh, verses together, you might think, why would Mary, out of all people, not have faith? Right? About roughly 30 years prior to this, Mary encountered an angel and told her what was going to happen. Right? We all know the, the story that an angel came to Mary and told her that she was, going, she, was, she was going to give birth to the Son of God. And for whatever, but whatever reason, we see that during this time, Jesus' own physical family, his own flesh and blood rejected him. Perhaps, maybe not in the way that we see the Pharisees who are out to harm Jesus. But they certainly didn't exhibit the faith in Christ that was required for salvation. Maybe they were having the same doubts or wondered the same things that John the Baptist was wondering as we studied earlier and read earlier. They're like, this, this was not what we were expecting. I thought we were waiting, we were waiting for a, a political messiah, someone that would actually free us from the reign and tyranny of the Roman government. This, what is going on here? And it must have been difficult for his brothers to see him as anything else other than, well, his own brother. And as this, as this moment, this current moment right here in this passage, they had a difficult time grasping the teachings of Jesus. With this, a jarring question arises. Right, if Jesus' own family, his own flesh and blood, did not qualify them based on familial relationships alone, then how does one enter this family Jesus is talking about? It has to be faith in Christ and faith alone. The will of God spoken here in verse 50 should be taken as a summary of the essence of discipleship. God's will is to bring people to him through the Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus draws this line, this, this line in the sand that it is only faith in me and me alone that will bring you into this kingdom and into this family. Even my physical family will not have this type of access to me that they think they do if they do not have faith in me. You can't just call upon me while being outside of this spiritual family. 
Jesus is saying that even though this is my mother on earth and these are my half-brothers, people that I grew up with, there's a difference between a physical family and a spiritual family. And even, even though we might have the closest relationship here on earth because we are flesh and blood, there's a, there's a spiritual aspect that goes beyond that. Oftentimes I would hear people say, uh, you know, especially as a pastor, they, they're a Christian because they grew up in a Christian family. And a lot of times people will go, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was raised a Christian. People will say that, right? And then if you even t- have people take uh, surveys, like what, what religion uh, you know, do, you, do you subscribe to or identify with? A lot of people, especially where I came from in Texas, uh, in the South, they will say a uh, Christian because I, I grew up at a church, my family are Christians, and they're like, well, I just kind of go along with what my family says. And it's really odd for me as a pastor to maybe meet some of these people and have conversation with them when I hear my like, hey, so tell me, tell me how you came to Christ. Like, well, I grew up, I grew up at the church and uh, my family's a Christian, so they just raised me to be a Christian, so therefore I'm a Christian. And hearing nothing about their faith and their trust in Jesus, hearing nothing about their repentance and surrender and their loyalty and their love towards Jesus, and it's just everything was based on, well, this is what my family's about, so that's what I'm about. It's always a really odd conversation to try to explain to them, you know, it doesn't sound like you are a Christian. As a pastor, you think that you'd be encouraged to hear people, like, I'm a Christian, like, but... If you are basing it on your family, it might not, you might not be a Christian. Actually, if you are basing it on your family and family alone, you are not a Christian. And for some people, they might feel like, I'm, I'm a Christian because it was just passed on through my family traditions and values. Those are some difficult conversations I have as a pastor. But the thing is, Christ never said that this is how one becomes a believer. That it gets passed on from generation to generation. This is not what it means. It wasn't what physical family you came from that makes you who you, that, that, that brings you to Christ. But it's actually whether you responded to Jesus in faith and trust alone. Scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that Jesus came to save sinners. He came. And he's lived this perfect life. He became a perfect substitute and sacrifice for sin. So when when he was crucified on a Roman cross, that is where the consequence of sin was paid for on the behalf of sinners. Rebels, people like you and me. He died, rose again three days later, proving that what he said was true. That his words are true. And his sacrifice is complete. And so for those who enter into this family, it is only through faith and trust in Jesus and what he did on their behalf. That is the only way one enters this family. The Son of God came to give his life so many can be saved. This is the good news, the gospel that brings people to him. It was never about what earthly family you came from, but rather if you would respond to your heavenly father. And what we learn later on, Jesus' mother and his brothers would eventually come to faith. But at this current moment, they were not. And it would not be through familial relations, but through the Son of God's life and sacrifice. That is how they would come to become part of this deeper and more intimate family with Jesus. Acts chapter 1 verse 14 tells us that Mary and Jesus' brothers were among the believers after Jesus ascended. And they were praying together with the believers. Later we find out that James, one of the half-brothers of Jesus, he became the leader or like the senior pastor of the Jerusalem church. And most likely wrote the book of James. And in the book of James, he refers himself to as the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, never once mentioning his bloodlines with Jesus. Because he realized and recognized that this is what is the more important relation. And this family, this spiritual family in Christ, is the only one that can be entered through by faith. And so I have to ask us this morning, have we entered this family by faith. I think what's really uh, 
difficult for some of us that might have grown up in the church. We forget that we can't just piggyback off of our parents' faith. But our faith has to be our own. And in this spiritual family, our response has to be our own response. Our repentance has to be our own repentance. Our confessions have to be our own confessions. Our own trust has to be our own. This family is not only entered into and bound together by faith in Jesus, but we are seeing this, like, this vertical relationship. Like how do we enter this family? It's through Christ and Christ alone. But we see this spiritual family in Christ. It has a deeper commitment. We're now going to see this horizontal connection that Jesus is making. That this family has a deeper commitment to one another. And as we mentioned earlier, Jesus' earthly family, right, they thought they should have precedent over the crowd. They came to him expecting a response. And as a son, as a member of their family unit, that there should have been no higher loyalty or deeper commitment than to them. So they go to them. They go, they go to Jesus and like, who else would you have a higher loyalty and commitment to than us, your family? And Jesus' response dismisses this notion. Right? He stretches out his hand towards his side and goes, here are my mother and my brothers. And there is this fierce dedication, not only to the will of God, where he says, right, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven. But there is a strong dedication and fierce dedication to the people of God as well. He tells them, this is my family. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. He tells them, this is my family. This is where my commitment and loyalty lies. These are my people. Jesus here is fully embracing this ragtag uh, group of followers and elevates them as mothers and brothers and sisters. He's literally saying, my family is looking for me? Well, here they are, those who listen and respond to my word. He goes, that is my family. Now, Jesus is not discounting his earthly family. He isn't disrespecting his earthly family. What Christ is doing is R.T. R.T. Francois puts it, he points out that there's a tie which is closer even than that of family. That, he's not trying to push down earthly family, but trying to show us that there is something much deeper, a much deeper relationship you can have, not with only your heavenly father, but with one another on this earth. Christ is like, yeah, blood is thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than blood. And this is why time and time again, Scripture tells us and reminds us to love one another. Love one another as you loved yourself. Uh, if you love one another, you know that all men will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. Time and time again, Christ tells us to love one another. For the church to care for one another. To pray for one another. To, uh, to sacrifice for one another. Why? Because Christ is saying, you are family. We are family. Our Heavenly Father is our Father. And we are family with one another. So this is a different type of family. Instead of blood binding you together, it is your faith that binds you to one another. Do we see each other in such a way? There's this one experience that stuck out, stuck out to me for many years. I was a senior in college, and I stayed behind a lab one of those days. I was talking to my TA, uh, had some questions. I can't even remember what I was doing. But, you know, I, 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 I talked to him. It was like one of those large classes, and I just had some questions. And then I left, went to the bus stop, and I was waiting for the bus. And later on, this TA I guess when he finished up, he was, I met him at the bus stop again. We bumped into each other. We made some small talk. And for whatever reason, and, um, and this TA, he's not from America. He's, um, he's, he was, a, he was a, um an international student from Korea. And so we were talking. And for whatever reason, it, gave, it, it came to faith. And I remember sharing him that I was a Christian. And the response I received was one that, it was like so, it was, there was nothing special about this whole interaction but the response stood out to me, even till this day. I remember when he found out I was a believer, he looked at me, and he was so excited. Like, we were just talking, all of a sudden, he perked up, and he goes, you're a Christian? I'm a Christian, too. And he was so excited about 
seeing another brother in Christ. And I was just kind of like taken back, just, you know, growing up in the States, having, and growing, growing up in the South, you almost like take for granted, like, yeah, we're just like Christians, no big deal. But seeing this person go like, wow, like, we are family, right? Like, he, he had this connection immediately with me. And he just perked up. And throughout the years, time and time again, I would meet random strangers. And we would find out that they were believers. And they would share things with me. Hard life situations. I would, I would be able to pray for them and pray with them. I remember this one time we were uh, coming home from a vacation. It was just me, my wife, and my, my daughter at that time. And she was maybe a couple years old, super young. And we walked in. Uh, you know, we were on Southwest Airline. We come in, and you know you get to pick your own seats. And there's just like one person that I saw that I go, I don't know why, I just want to sit next to that person. He had like, he was this big, uh, looked like a really tall guy, tattoos everywhere, long dreadlocks. And I go, I just want to sit next to him. I don't know why. I, just, I was just like, I just, want to, I just want to talk to this guy. I, I, I just felt drawn to him. And I go and I sit down. We get settled in. I turn and I looked at his tattoos. And I saw verses all over the tattoos. And I was like, I, I just want to talk to this guy. I want to know if he knows what he has on his skin, right? I remember when I started talking to him, I find out he's a believer. I find out that, and this man, he starts sharing his life with me. He's like, I used to be part of this huge uh, rock band back in the 90s, and I was living this crazy rock star life. Uh, doing drugs and sex and all this stuff. And he's sharing all these things to me. And he tells me how he came to Christ by faith. And here he is sharing his faith with me. And I was telling him, like, I, I'm a believer too. And this is, and I'm like, I'm just so encouraged. And we got to talk to each other. We prayed for each other. And this man was ready to share his faith with anybody. And he finds, I just like, we, we just end up learning that we were both believers and just super encouraged by that. Uh, you can actually find his testimony online. He has a video online. Uh, if you've ever heard of the website IamSecond.com, um, there's like tons of testimonies on there. And he was like one of the first ones. And it was just crazy because I was like, dude, this is amazing to hear how the Lord moved in your life and how I got to share just like my life and just to share like this, this is my kid. And he was talking about how he had a daughter. I'm like, this is my daughter. And we were just... We bonded, not because of anything. Like, I, I never listened to his music. Right? I know nothing about his music. I've heard of his band, but I knew nothing about his music. But we bonded together because, because of Christ and Christ alone, about what Christ has done in our lives. And it's in those moments I, I was reminded by, like, and for us, church, you and me, we all share this intimate bond and connection together because, not because we are related by our shared blood, but we're related because of Christ's blood shed on our behalf. That is something amazing that I think a lot of times we tend to forget. Right? Do we see each other in that way? Right, do we connect our relationship with one another like, wow, we are, we are family that should really care and love one another because, because Christ is our elder brother, our heavenly father is our father. We are a part of the same family and same kingdom. We're a bond, we're, we're bought and brought together by his blood. There is something incredibly intimate and beautiful but how Christ's plan of redemption includes bringing people to not only to himself, but to each other. That it is not just this individual thing between me and God, but Christ says, I am bringing a people to myself and this, these people that are brought together with each other. So we can't forget that. That our love for Christ actually binds us to one another. And this is why we are spending this upcoming year, our theme, tilling together. Because we want to remind ourselves and teach ourselves and, and show each other, like, this is what being Christ's family looks like. Creating this Christ-like community by cultivating a culture of care for one another. And why are we able to do that? Because Christ died for 
us. That Christ brought us together. So I want us to be reminded this morning of the application and implications of this great and wonderful truth as being part of Christ's family. What does it mean for us today? I think for some of us this morning, it should bring great comfort. It should bring great comfort. I, I know that some of us, like we can't always assume and expect that. We all came from these great, wonderful families with, uh, with wonderful, familiar relations. And some of us come from broken families, from hard backgrounds. And it should bring us comfort because it reminds us that we are part of a deeper family. Psalm chapter 68 verse 6 tells us that the Lord sets the lonely in families. And perhaps you might have come from a family who don't, you don't know who, Jesus, who, who don't know Jesus. And it might be hard for them to understand why are you following this Jesus? Why is this so important to you? We're reminded that we have a spiritual family that deeply understands why this matters. For others, it should convict our hearts. Perhaps we have built fences and boundaries around our lives. We have kept brothers and sisters at arm's length. And we're reminded this morning, this is not what the Lord has called us to do. And it's time for us to tear down some of those boundaries and take some risks to build closer intimate relationships with other brothers and sisters in Christ here at our church. This should also stir our hearts to commit to one another. Reminded that we are part of this grand spiritual family. Let us commit to reaching out to one another, to pray for one another, to care for one another, to be in the lives of one another. Maybe so bold. And challenge the church this morning to go and reach out to somebody else in this church this week. Maybe, maybe it could just be simple, something as simple as a, a chat on the phone, a text message. Hey, I, love, I, I want to pray for you. Is there anything I can pray for you? Or maybe you, know, you can uh, grab a meal or grab coffee, however that can be done safely. Whatever that you, you, know, you and the other people are most comfortable with. It is a different time we're living in now, but it doesn't mean that we should stop trying to reach out to people, reach out to our own church family. Some of us have been in more difficult times during this pandemic. How would the body live out family values of Christ today with one another? Let us fully embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning in our own lives by embracing the spiritual family that the Lord has put us in. Following Christ by faith it's not only an expression of the will of God, but it brings us into a family and it binds us to a people of God. Let us not forget that this morning. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, it's so good to call you Father. It reminds me that I am part of this great, amazing spiritual family, people of various backgrounds different cultures, different creeds, just all sorts of people that you brought and said, this, this is a new family that we've been adopted into, that we're brought into, that we're not part of. Thank you so much. And I pray, Lord, that we live in a way that honors you by loving and caring for each other. Let us, not be, let us be reminded and not forget of this great and amazing family that we are part of. May we glorify you with the way we treat and love one another. May that proclaim and portray the gospel and shine a light to those around us. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Before, after. We've been, it's been a long time, y'all. Okay, okay. C, for communion first. Okay, all right. <laughs> Okay, I'm right, all right. We're good, we're good. Hey, we've been away for so long. This is very odd for us. All right, we are now. <laughs> oh, thank you. As we, <laughs> as we set up, um, let us prepare our hearts for a time to reflect on the Lord's Supper. As we spent all this time 
preaching, the, like as, as we were learning this morning about what it means to be part of a spiritual family, we were reminded this morning, a uh, part of what that looks like, a tangible example, is when we take the Lord's Supper together. That we, the Lord's Supper is a representation of the many coming together as one. And granted, we can't do that right now as we break bread and we have our own individual cups. But it is a representation that with one bread, it binds us all together. And as we metaphorically, allegorically share one cup, we are reminded that it's the many that come together as one. Building, showing our, our unity with one another. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave thanks and he, and he gave it and he passed it to the disciples. He says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup out there supper. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood. Do this uh, as often as you drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians that whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. And so we are reminded to examine our own hearts, examine ourselves before we eat the bread and drink the cup, lest we eat and drink judgment on ourselves. So this morning I want us to spend some time to examine our own hearts. If there are areas that need to be repented of, let us come to the Lord in repentance. If there is areas that we need to get right with God, let us do that this morning. And after a brief moment of prayer and examination and meditation, we're going to come back together. And that will prompt us and we'll eat together, symbolizing that of our unity and drink together, again, symbolizing our unity. Uh, but uh, before we do that, let me pray for our time, and then we'll have a time of meditation, and then we'll take together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We ask that you bless this bread and bless, bless this cup. May we be reminded of the sacrifice your son has made on our behalf, that we can now approach you freely and confidently because of the, your son's righteousness imparted to us and our sins paid for by him. May you reveal the areas of our hearts that we need to bring before you this morning. May we come before you in humility, come before you in worship. We call this in your son's name.
CFC, we want to invite all baptized believers uh, to partake in the Lord's Supper with us together. And so if you are, um, if you have placed your trust and hope in Jesus Christ and uh, represented through uh, water baptism, I ask that uh, we partake together. Jesus says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is, cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now we're going to stand and respond uh, to the sermon today. If you could stand with us, that'd be awesome.
Please bow with me. Not to him is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping alongside us this morning. Um, we look forward to having you return uh, for those who are online. Uh, but until then, have a very blessed week. For everybody who is here uh, um, at, in the sanctuary, please hang tight. Uh, the ushers will be bringing around uh, sanitization uh, wipes and uh, will uh, dismiss you accordingly. Uh, have a very blessed week. Love you 3,000. <laughs>